Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined today by Tom Barrett. Tom is the CEO of Engine Lease Finance. Tom is joining us for the purposes of our Aviation Leaders Report. And I should say we're discussing this in early December. Tom, thanks so much again for joining us. Um, I should say we're recording this in early December. Um, before we get into the meat of the conversation, do you want to tell our watchers a little bit about Engine Lease Finance? Okay. Well, um, ELFC are one of the longest established engine leasing companies, uh, having been founded in 1990, um, really at the infancy of engine leasing. Um, on the back of the aircraft leasing success of the previous decade, engine leasing was a new niche. Um, I think the development of it is very much to bear in mind that it's about the spare engines and it remains so today. Within the industry, uh, we would be one of the largest independent lessors owned by a very strong parent and committed parent, MHC, uh, based in Tokyo. Um, there are, the industry is broadly divided between um, the uh, manufacturer-owned engine lessors, um, Pratt & Whitney and Rolls-Royce, GE having divested their engine lease business to um, Aircap um, late last year or early this year. So as an independent, you have Aircap and ELFC, Willis Lease Finance, Sumitomo, and um, Team uh, also. They'd be the major, I suppose, engine lessors at the moment. And Tom, could you tell us a little bit before we get into maybe what happened in 22 and what's going to happen in 23, can you talk to us a little bit about engine leasing and just operationally how it works? So you obviously have kind of the short term and the sale and lease back market. Can you articulate a little bit about how those markets operate? I think um, a difference perhaps from the aircraft market um, is that as a complete engine lessor, we are very active for sourcing a product in the sale and lease spec, but we are determined and indeed see it as uh, one of our strengths that we're with the engine right through. So we go from delivery of engines, often conducting sale and lease specs on used engines previously delivered to the airlines to give them opportunity to realize some capital and then um, leasing the engine with the, through the primary lease, secondary, maybe third lease, and ultimately looking to run down life where the engine can ultimately exit our portfolio through our parts company, which is INEF based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, when you are an engine owner and you have an engine off lease, you are a short term lessor, a medium term lessor, and a long term lessor, because clearly you have to follow demand. There's no prizes for having your inventory build up. Um, there are challenges, perhaps, and I suppose a challenge we learned way back in the beginning, you know, our first 10 years of operations, we learned how to manage short-term leasing. And I think that's um, a very important skill set to develop if you are truly going to maximize the value of the engines. Um, many of the disciplines of the sale and lease spec, which tend to be the long-term lease spec, and the short-term leasing are similar, um, demand as much diligence in some respects, but naturally you're doing it for much quicker turn time and uh, perhaps maybe l often less reward because you are, with your, the lease of your inventory engines, you are totally at the mercy of the market. There's no room for fancy financing products to enhance the sale and lease back opportunity. It's all about taking the market rate on your leased inventory. And looking then at that demand element, Tom, we've seen a, a very strong recovery in air travel across 22, certain pockets of the world that are more challenged. How has that fed in for your business and how have you seen demand evolve over the course of this year? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's not unlike what we see from IATA and the other published sources about recovery. You know, um, at the beginning of the recovery, it was about North America. It spread to South America. It became Europe. And I suppose when I would have been talking to you a year or so ago, Joe, we would have been contemplating a much stronger recovery and sustained perhaps recovery in Europe and a much stronger recovery out of Asia. 2022 has not for the geopolitical reasons um, in Europe perhaps and for the continuing pandemic issues in Asia have not um, turned out that way. We've had a very slow recovery in Asia and in Europe, 
what I felt could have been a record year had the edge, I feel, taken off it due to the geopolitical um, issues in Russia, Ukraine. And feeding that out as you look into 23, where are, are you focused on an asset type from an opportunities perspective? Or are you focused on a market type? Where do you see your key opportunities coming over the next 12 months? I think um, in terms of acquisitions, which is, you know, drives our business in the long run, I think it'll come from the usual um, leasing sources, which are, you know, not investment grade customers. Um, there are territories where we see stronger demand historically, South America perhaps, Asia, and um, pockets in Europe. So I think for our new business, I think it'll be back to those places because the airlines do need the support of the capital we can provide and I think the very competitive lease rates we can provide too. In terms of the inventory leasing, which is you know equally an important part of our business, I think we're going to see quite a bit of demand out of Asia. If, if it does follow um, the Americas and Europe recovery, which we think it will when the shackles are off, I think um, there's going to be an awful lot of demand because as we've seen in uh, the Americas and Europe, as aircraft are re-entering the market, there is quite an uh, amount of pent-up demand for the co consumer initially but that does feed into pent-up demand for the spare engines, which is where we come in. And you, you mentioned these rate factors there. Curious on your thoughts as to how you've seen that evolve and probably linking that point just to the prevailing interest rate environment. So we knew interest rate rises were coming, probably not at this scale and pace. Um, lease rate factors has always been, uh, you know, increased but not in direct correlation. So curious as to what you're seeing from a lease rate factor perspective and just the challenges that the current interest rate environment is throwing up for your business. Yeah. Um, well, I think one thing it's done is it's testing the metal of maybe some of the new entrants. Um, as a, a long-term investor doing it for many years, much of what we're seeing now we've seen before. We've had higher interest rates before. We know how to deal with it. I think in terms of the specifics for the, again, the acquisition and maybe dividing up our, our business again that way. The sale and lease back market, there is not quite a linear movement to increase the interest rates, but it has to follow. Because, you know, drawn down funding in today's market is a different proposition than it was back in 2019, 2020. Um, in terms of, and I suppose to stick with that for a minute, I think that is where somebody like ELFC with the scale and with the access to um, support from a very strong parent company does gain some competitive advantage because we're not at the mercy of the market. In terms of the inventory leasing and again being a market taker, to uh, use that expression, when it comes to leasing the engines you already own and have available, um, you really are at the mercy of the, uh, supply and demand. And I'm pleased, I suppose, now to say that we are seeing the supply reduce, the demand increase, and it is helping those lease rentals. But they do not necessarily follow the interest rate, uh, you know, uh, profile, because they are, you know, ultimately down to the market. Yeah, and it probably feeds into your perspectives on the debt market. Um, so you say, more interest volatility. Have you seen any retrenchment from the typical aviation lenders? Or do you see a market that's still relatively stable and functioning, albeit with the premium that the rate increase, increases have driven? Um, I, we're not in that space as much as, uh, uh, as some of the other lessors would be, be the engine or aircraft. Um, I would say there has been some fall off. Um, you know, you are paying for it now, in a way, and um, in terms of it functioning, to meet our requirements, it is functioning. We have no concern in that regard. I think it'll be interesting to see, and it's obvious perhaps uh, another topic, ABS, but you know, I think some of the froth out of the, um, the available um, debt and other sources are, have dried up, and I think um, for the established lessors with a good track record 
I expect they will be able to get access to what they need to grow, whereas I think some of the uh, ones with less scale or maybe less maturity um, will have more difficulty. To pick up on that scale point, you know, thinking about it in, in your business, have you, have you had a shift in perspective around scale? I mean, scale in any business, in any sector is important. Do you think in this environment, heightened uncertainty, heightened interest rate, that, that scale becomes even more important? Um, it, it probably does. Um, I think, though, Joe, I'd put it that what has become much more important are the good sound principles that are the platform of any good leasing business. And that is diversification, diversification of geography, diversification of equipment, um, you know, knowing you, the asset you're investing in. Um, I think, I'm sure many of the aircraft lessors would agree, but we are asset owners and investors and managers where I do not see our business as a financing business. Clearly, there's some financial support to the market when we bring our, our considerable resources to play in the sale and leaseback market. But we look at the metal through the life of the metal. And from that point of view, um, we're, uh, we think that it might not be quite, it's not just scale, it's all of the good portfolio management principles that um, dictate, you know. And you mentioned your kind of strong parent that's been there for a good length of time uh, at this stage. Uh, coming from Japanese background, Japan and aviation have a long and very strong history together. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, your, from the parent's perspective, your interaction with them over the last couple of years? Aviation's had a heightened environment. We came out of COVID probably very strongly, but were impacted more than most sectors coming into it. Russia had probably an outsized impact on the sector versus others. Um, when you're chatting to your parent and their engagement and their belief in the aviation sector, how has that evolved over the last couple of years? I think as a long-term investor, they've proven to be very resilient in the, uh, in the market uncertainty. Um, you know, the thing, and I suppose again, we have had Japanese parentage since 1996. So we have a very long and good track record with Japanese parents, albeit part of the MHC group now since 2014, but previously been part of uh, MUFG, the bank. Um, so their uh, investment in aviation was always a long-term strategy. And I think in terms of the pandemic, what while their metal may have been tested in that regard, um, the fact that they did have um, an engine leasing and an aircraft leasing uh, subsidiary GSA with considerable experience, I think it gave them the confidence to continue to support. And, you know, for ELFC, we have had record investment through the pandemic. And uh, that's consistent with previous market downturns where the time to invest is when there's opportunity. And um, our parent has been extraordinary in that support. And, and looking, staying with the Japanese market for a moment, if we think, you know, on, on the fixed wing side, Jalco has been a very popular uh, financing product for a long period of time. You, you look back over engine and say, well, maybe ticket size wasn't there. You look at how much an engine costs now, you look at where US dollar has gone. Is, is that a market that is opening up more from a, you know, a product perspective for someone like ELF? Uh, yes. Um, you know, it's been a long held wish of mine and the rest of our management team that having had a Japanese parent for so long, we really did feel, um, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we should have been able to develop something. And unfortunately, you're quite right, Joe, because of the ticket size. Um, ex exchange rates are playing a part too at the moment with the appreciation of the dollar because dollar assets are obviously, um, relatively speaking, uh, much higher value in yen. Um, the, we do find now that there's much more interest. I think it's still quite difficult to do because I think the Japanese investor market has to move to engines from you know being familiar with the airframe asset. And in some ways, it mirrors my own experience at the start of my career with ELFC when the banking community really did not want to talk about engines because if an engine came without an airframe, it didn't really um, make much sense to them. But I think, and I'd be confident that over time, 
the Jalco market, just as other markets, will accept the engine asset um, for the value it's worth because in terms of residual and so on and so forth, it's tested and proven now. Yeah, it's a variation of a trusted asset class. Yeah, yeah no, understood. Um, can you talk to me a little bit, Tom, around your fleet focus right now, or your, I should say, your asset focus as much as anything? You know, when we have uh, some of your aircraft leasing counterparts in that seat, they talk about the movement to new technology. It's similar on your side, and do you want to talk to us a little bit around how uh, ELFC has started to make that transition and, and how successful you've been and where you'd like to get to? Um, well, I suppose, Outside of the ESG concerns, ELFC's um, trajectory has always been about investing in the newer technology. I think the urgency for um, sustainability and ESG principles is that we're probably increasingly focused on that in uh, maybe a stronger way than we would have through previous technology shifts. And that's in common with aircraft lessors. Um, in terms of the success, well, we are well over, uh, with mandated transactions, well over 50% of our portfolio is transitioned. Um, it's safe to say that, you know, like the aircraft lessors, we're investing in the latest technology. Naturally, that's going to be in the engine space, the Pratt & Whitney GTF and the CFMI Leap. But, you know, we're also happy to invest in some of the Rolls wide body and the, um, the G Gen X product. So it's about the fuel efficient technology for ELFC right now. And um, in terms of uh, a full transition, it's going to be many years before we will be out of the current technology. Um, and that's because as an asset manager, investor and so on, we are keen to maximize the return from those assets as they do run down their life and ultimately we do exit them through the recycling uh, opportunities provided by our parts company. And, and feeding into that, that metal element, so say half new tech, half older tech, which still is a very long and useful life, um, what's the trading environment out there like at the moment? So if we look again on the aircraft side, we see OEM delays, probably interest rate environment, pricing, a lot, lot of clog right yeah. in the market. Is it similar on the engine side at the moment? Uh, I would say it is. Um, the trading environment is, uh, well, if I've understood your reference to Clog, it's, it's held up very yeah. well. Yeah. Um, the newer technology, um, because of the lease rent rates that they were done at in the um, very competitive interest rate or leasing environment, really, but driven by the extremely low uh, interest rates, um, they are. I'd imagine I'd have to say problematic for sale right now because the returns are not there if somebody is looking at the current interest rate environment. In terms of the current technology though, the returns are there. There's a lot of good stories through the pandemic of airlines who were able to honor their bills, who were able to meet their obligations and who are committed to the long term to that product. So in terms of the trading environment, we have seen uh, and met considerable success over the last few years. and. Um, I think the indications are that's going to continue for some time. Um, in terms of the OEM delays, clearly a contributing factor, but I do think the rebound of the market post pandemic is going to increase that um, demand and probably maintain that demand because even if the manufacturers did deliver all their equipment in accordance with their, uh, I suppose, optimistic forecasts, that demand, I think, as we see the recovery, will be sustained for a few more years, at least. And if we can, yeah, let's if we can keep it that theme on the engine OEMs, um, you know, I'd say they're catching a lot of heat at the moment around, you know, they're, they're, everyone has had supply chain problems, which people acknowledge and are trying to come out of COVID. Um, there seems to be some challenges in embedding that new technology. Can you talk to us a little bit about how those challenges have arisen? Well, I think the manufacturers could do better than I will, but um, you know, clearly it is new technology, and I think the uh, the entry into service has created issues. I think some of the uh, tougher climates in which that equipment is operating has perhaps created some issues, um, and it seems consistent. You know, it's new technology; it's going to take some time to settle down. 
the manufacturers have sought, I suppose, to increase the spares ratio initially so that they can cover any um, operational entry into service issues. Um, that work continues and from, I suppose, our point of view, we're keen to play our part in either helping the manufacturers or the, um, the airlines to, to have the required amount of spares. Uh, I would say while they may get on top of the, um, the supply chain issues, i.e. the manufacturing piece, I think the operational piece, there's a bit more to run on that. And I think for the next couple of years, we'll be seeing um, that continue to create some difficulties and challenges. And have you seen any evolution of ELFC's relationship with OEMs over the last couple of years? Again, harking back to the aircraft side, which I don't want to do every time, but we have seen, I'd say, uh, a, an increase in the importance of the leasing community to the OEMs. They're taking on more deliveries, they're more active in sale and lease back. Similar trend line, my, my, my gut reaction here is that you're getting more respect, <laughs> which is what that's, some people That's probably a good, w- good way of putting it, Joe. Um, I think we are. Um, you know, I think there's many reasons for that. Um, I suppose over the years, we might have been perceived, and you know, our scale perhaps merited it, that we were not really relevant at the OEM table. Um, I think our increased scale, I think the challenges for the OEMs over this pandemic in particular, you know, they had the movement to new technology that brought its own entry into service issues. That then got wrapped up in a pandemic that is, you know, the worst downturn this industry has seen. And I think naturally enough, it did open the door to maybe more dialogue, more ways of collaboration. Um, so I think a combination of the factors and, and I, I suppose the fact that we have also strategically so to be working closer with the OEMs rather than in parallel or sometimes considered against the OEMs' interests, that was not in our interests nor we feel in their interests. So I think um, it is fair to say that the relationship has improved through the pandemic and you know we have conducted some business directly with OEMs in a way that we ha- would not have done before. Previously, um, in the first 25 years of the company, um, 30 years of the company, it was all about um, just buying spare engines off them directly. But we have managed to, to conduct some direct business with the, less, with the uh, OEMs to support their pools. And uh, I think that is something I'd like to see develop further. Yeah, no, understood. And coming back to a theme you've touched on a couple of times, Tom, around ESG with a big focus on the E, um, can cut, cut lots of strands to this. Maybe the first one is the improvements that are being made by the new technology aircraft or new new technology engines. So we had expectations of what they would do. Has that followed through, or what have we seen from an emissions perspective on the new tech? I'm led to believe by all independent, not just OEM measures, they have managed to meet the requirements, and I think in some cases exceeded the targets. So I think in terms of the emissions, they're playing their part. And I think that's you know, another reason for ELFC to you know, go full steam ahead into that technology because it actually is making the difference it had hoped to make. Um, I think the challenges for us in that new technology are more about figuring out the right number of spares and the uh, operational requirements that will be there long term. Because ultimately, if we are going to invest in the spare engines, we have to make sure they're assets that can be um, that are in demand. And, and that demand element, are you hearing from your airline customers that the ESG pressures are driving their demand? Um, I think for maybe those in the more sophisticated markets where they're accessing their own um, financing in the markets as well, perhaps they're feeling some pressure. Um, I think every airline um, low-cost carrier or legacy carrier will like to, you know, talk about its credentials in this area going forward. That's that's a given. So it is becoming more relevant. I think in terms of tangible difference it's making to cost of funds or access to capital just yet, I think that's a little bit more to go. But there's definitely a movement across the industry, leasing airlines and everybody else to be able to talk and uh, I suppose deliver on improved credentials. So, 
And, and on the financing side, is there more or is it just a case of look, we invest in the best, lowest emission new technology piece and that's the part you play on the financing side? Or you think there's more as a leasing community that we should be doing in relation to the challenge? Um, I, well, I think uh, Aircraft Leasing Ireland have done a good job with the charter. Um, I think it's very worthwhile exercise to galvanise the leasing community in Ireland, which is such a, a major part of the global leasing community, into some kind of action or commitment. Now, I know we have to deliver on some of the commitments and indeed the metrics have to be ironed out. But I do think the leasing community is playing their part. And I think um, with the support through ALI and um, I suppose owners as well, like ultimately our owner is responsible to its shareholders and there is little doubt that they have to be able to talk about their credentials. So I think um, we will see more and more of a part being played. I think the new technology is clearly the biggest part of it, but I, I would say over the next few years I expect to see a contribution perhaps in the uh, SAF, the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Space, because I think to really drive on the airline sustainability uh, measures for the next 20 years it's going to be about SAF and I expect the leasing community and governments and airlines and probably OEMs as well will play their part in developing that piece of it. Yeah, I, th I think that's right, Tom. You kind of say if, if SAF is your key building block and you know how to finance the asset itself, there, there's a role to be played. And I think that the SAF piece, you're right, it's good. It's government supports and then it's technological developments, which are important. The last question I had, just ESG related, is, is how high in the radar is it when you talk to your shareholder? So how conscious are they around kind of sizing, you know, your emissions output or the things you're doing to improve it? Um, I would say it's getting up there, with, you know, I think performance is still maybe uh, profitability performance and, and such measures are, are very important to any shareholder. But there is little doubt that we devote time at every board meeting, every quarterly executive meeting to the ESG um, discussion. And they are very anxious for us to have a credible policy in that regard. Yeah, I think consistent themes that, that we're hearing, I think, from most CEOs. Just in, in closing, Tom, that there's lots of uncertainty out there in the market. We, we know we talked to interest rates, talked to the FX challenges, global recession or not, somewhat buffered, as you say, by parts of the market that haven't recovered yet. With all that uncertainty, but, but some global macros that would give you a, a bit of positivity, what are your optimism levels like? As you're looking out into 23, what are they like? They're pretty good. Um, you know, I think as the airlines have come out of the crisis, they're now able to focus on rebuilding their balance sheets, which I think is traditionally a good space for lessors like ourselves who, who are active in the sale and lease market. Um, in terms of the demand and supply, it's coming back into equilibrium, hence our inventory is moving. Um, you know, it's got a bit to go, but it's moving in the right direction. And I, I really do think none of us were able to measure how, or maybe accurately guess how strong the recovery would be when it came in the Americas, when it's come in Europe. And I expect to see the same in Asia, because we've seen once the restrictions are lifted, the market is very quick to respond in terms of opening up. Too fast maybe for the infrastructure to catch up sometimes, as we saw in some of the airports this summer, in Europe in particular. But um, I've little doubt that the Asian recovery will drive a lot in 2023, and it does leave me optimistic. Well, Tom, on that hopeful note, uh, I'd like to thank you as always for your excellent insights and wish you and Engine Lease Finance a very successful 23. Thanks, Great. Mel.